Okay, so we have a really fantastic programme this afternoon, um, and I'm delighted to introduce the first speaker, Professor Ken Pounds from the University of Leicester, who's going to be talking to us about the origins of X-ray astronomy in the UK. Well, good afternoon. This really takes me back coming here. It's quite a while since I... And it was a different platform. So, okay, I'm going to talk about, um, as it says, about the history of X-ray astronomy in the UK. 60 years old last month, which sadly it refers to the topic, not to the speaker. <laughs> and um, you might just notice that if there are references and so on, a few facts upside down in this talk, you can check in February's A and G, which will be covering a similar. Uh, a similar story. Thanks to Mike Watson for this one, actually, which just allows me to mention what is an important distinction which is now fading, and that is that traditionally um, our involvement, our UK involvement in X ray astronomy was very much led by hardware groups who designed, built, and, um, and then exploited. Uh, Equipment on all of these missions you see there, they, ho they all had um, UK hardware involvement. That's tending not to be the case now. And the main groups involved at that level were, as you can see, Leicester, UCL, which be became MSL, of course, Birmingham, Imperial, <coughs> and Rutherford Lab. I think the two that are hanging on in there are probably best at the moment are those two on the left. Uh, and to start, since it's a historical talk, I'll go right, right back to the start, uh, basically when, when I was a, joined uh, the rocket group at UCL as a, a student not quite knowing what I was going to be doing. Um, and this takes us back to the start of the space age, basically, when, of course, Sputnik was launched, shocked the world, uh, had a fairly dramatic impact in America with, uh, in particular, the formation of NASA, and the Sputnik itself, as some of you will know, was, a, was basically just a, an orbiting transmitter, just making bleeps to make people know that the Soviet Union could actually do things like that. Uh, so the space age began, in a way, in 1957, when that happened. Um, well, here in the UK... Um, Fortunately for me, having just signed up to the rocket group at UCL, some of the founding fathers had already been beavering away to, in particular, uh, establish the possibility of a sounding rocket which we could actually use. And you'll see there the basic details, I won't go through it. There was, of course, as always in the start of space programs, a synergy of interest between science and the military. At the time, post-Second World War, the military strategists had decided that future global wars would be fought in or through space, and so better find out more about the properties of the atmosphere through which uh, these devices might be launched. Anyway, thanks to some of the, as I say, in particular, uh, Harry Massey, the head of physics at UCL, like where I said already I was a student, uh, th we, we were given a head start, really, I suppose, outside of the big two of Soviet Union and the USA. And a key, a key point was in 57, in February 57, where the first Skylight rocket was launched from Woomera. Um, it, was, it was developed at the, the RAE in Farnborough and based on a, a guided weapon the C5 Series 3, I believe. And, and it, for the next 20 years, was a highly competitive uh, sounding rocket. And when I was preparing a talk six months ago to, to give at um, Riccardo Giacconi's um, memorial <coughs> meeting in, in Washington, it just occurred to me that, we, of course, Riccardo Giacconi was the man who discovered SCOEX-1 and really kicked off X-ray astronomy. We actually had the ability in the UK a few years before that, if we 
instead of flying just tiny little detectors to look at the sun, just because theoreticians said that would be the only thing to look at, if we'd just be, had a bit more imagination, etc., etc. Anyway, I didn't say that in America. <laughs> um, just, the politics of space was really interesting in those days, and I'll just point you, you to one uh, item there. The fact that this combination of interest between the military and scientists uh, managed to persuade the Treasury, and this was when the UK was really rather poor post-war, to come up with £100,000, uh, which was a lot of money. As you can see from what it did, it actually set up five <coughs> university groups for, three, for a three-year programme and delivered a large number of Skylarks. I mean, remarkably, the real costing of Skylark was £2,000. So you could, get a, you could get a Skylark rocket in those days for £2,000. Now, of course, inflation in that, you've got a, it's a factor of well over 10, nevertheless. Obviously, the costing wasn't real because a lot of the manpower was, was sort of already built in. Um, in addition, to, so the, we had then what you might call a, a national space research program, space science came later, which had two elements, Skylark and a, link, and a joint small satellite program with the Americans, which Harry Massey again had negotiated, which led, of course, to the aerial satellite series. So having mentioned Harry Massey, which was... You know, he's one of my, obviously one of my uh, scientific heroes alongside Len Hutton, my cricket hero, and et cetera. <laughs> and that's Harry Massey, of course, there, uh, along with Eric Dawling, who was another member of the, he was a civil servant, but a very important player at this time, together with Bob Bauman and the head of Goddard there, just doing what people like that do before launches, and this was before the launch of Ariel 1. Um, oh, and the other thing that Harry Matty is memorable for, to me at least, is that he actually offered me a, an admiral, admiralty grant to do a PhD at UCL. Now, why the admiralty should have been interested uh, is, again, an interesting question. <laughs> so, uh, that's just quickly me. I joined Robert Boyd's group at UCL in '56 and had a three-year program when I was mainly enjoying myself playing football for the London University, etc. Anyway, my, the data I got for my thesis eventually was, I think, historic only in being the first detection of X-rays from outer space by anybody with British equipment. <laughs> it was a very modest equipment. Uh, it was a camera, uh, a, a robust camera, which was exposed to the sun once above the atmosphere, through different filters. The rocket reached 132 kilometers, and on the way down, the uh, payload went a little bit too far because the parachute failed, and so we had to actually dig it out from 16 feet underground <laughs> below the desert. So it's quite, quite a journey, but we did get some data from that, otherwise I would be still Mr. Pounds, probably. <laughs> Anyway, um, I was then sort of transferred to Leicester in 1960 because the powers that be decided that X-ray observations from space, just the sun for starters, but there would be other things surely, would be worth setting up another university group, and that's when Leicester was formed in 1960. <coughs> Uh, with the Royal Society grant of £13,000 for a three-year programme. Now, that doesn't sound like a lot of money, but again, it was equivalent to, you know, almost, almost a million, or two-thirds of a million or something like that in those days. And, of course, we paid our people very poorly. <laughs> and, and that was the objective, to search for X-ray emission from the sun and other stellar sources, the other stellar sources were expected, to, however, to be like a billion times fainter. So at the beginning, we thought, well, we won't bother with those. This is a picture of this uh, group at Leicester with this character on the right looking a bit like I, I've come from the big city, <laughs> the one on, the, on your right uh, with the waistcoat, which I would feel a bit embarrassed about, but I always show it. 
<laughs> anyway, on to, on to action, as it were. So the first thing, our first priority was Area 1. There's a picture of Area 1. Launched on a US Air Force Delta in uh, April 62. Um, only three years after the deal was done with NASA, things really did move, could move really quickly in those days. Probably because we didn't have computers and lots of software and all that, but that's just my age <laughs> speaking. Uh, we got some really interesting broadband X-ray spectra for several weeks, showing how the solar spectrum um, intensifies and hardens as you get solar activity, in particular flares, got some quite nice data, but there was a nasty surprising story in that several weeks after the launch, the detectors died, and, it was, and other bits of the satellite died as well, and it turned out it was because the same US Air Force that had launched the satellite for us had chosen to detonate a hydrogen bomb in the atmosphere. They did things like that in those days. Um, and that disturbed the radiation belts and, and aerial fire was swamped with high energy electrons. And we had methane gas, gas quencher in our detectors. So basically a sort of margarine-like substance deposited quickly on, on the anode. Count, the gain went down and, and we were sort of dead. That did cause a bit of an international incident, not because it had hurt our detectors, but because the satellite itself had been damaged, particularly the solar cells. That picture is uh, from taken from Hawaii, where you're actually looking at the sky where the explosion took place, 400 kilometers above, above Johnson Island in the Pacific. And what we're seeing is, is basically excited oxygen uh, excited by what was going on. Well, that was basically um, it as far, no, sorry, to continue the, the, that particular objective of, of flying civil portion accounts and so on, together with atmospheric and atmospheric instruments, that program continued quite successfully with uh, the first EZRO satellite in 68, and two OSOs, OSO 4 and OSO 5. All of this was done jointly with, um, with UCL, where we, we were basically providing the detectors and some of the science lead. But this, at this point, this, the lead passed to Len, Len Colhane. We turned our uh, priorities to cosmic X ray astronomy because there had been another major incident the very same month of July. 1962, when Giacone actually uh, did have the imagination, or maybe the good fortune, or maybe a bit of both, to fly at, at night and, and detect Star X-1. <coughs> well, what we were able to do, of course, quite quickly was to use Skylark in order to carry out similar nighttime observations. Didn't actually need to be nighttime, but we tend to do that. From Woomera, where we had access to the southern hemisphere sky. And that was a period of really great fun. Uh, we actually found, um, the first time we flew, we actually flew at a time where SCOX-1 would be in would be above the, the atmosphere, would, would be above the horizon, as, as would the Crab Nebula. So we had those two as kind of markers, but we also saw an even brighter source, which a few weeks later had gone. So this was now, or is now, the first ever detected soft X-ray transient, which got the name Senex-2. Um, Skylark was made even more useful shortly after that with the addition of attitude control systems, starting off with the ability to point at the sun. So we were able to do some really quite neat experiments, which were perhaps more interesting t technically than scientifically. Uh, and this was one where we attempted to do a lunar occultation on one of the galactic bulge sources, which were a real mystery, very powerful, but we did because they were way behind lots of dust, you actually couldn't identify any optical counterpart. And there were two occultations worked out by Leslie Morrison at the RGO, the timing of. Uh, we did one, and Emma Sassel did another one shortly afterwards. And, it, and the logistics was, was quite, uh, quite neat. We had to... 
Oh, sorry. We had to fly within a few seconds in order for the, uh, our, the payload to be uh, at apogee just as the moon was crossing the, the then rather large <coughs> error box of a degree or so uh, in order to catch the occultation. It worked fine, as you can see uh, here. Um, at least as far as the, the, the experiment was concerned, but unfortunately, even though we had um, an error box of 0.3 arc seconds, and the MSSL one, which for some reasons was not quite as precise, was just over an arc second. So that was for many years the most precisely determined position of a cosmic character source, but there was absolutely nothing to see, and it wasn't until many years later with, with an infrared source was detected probably that was the stellar system that we've been looking at. So that was an experiment that was great fun to do, didn't actually add a great deal to human knowledge. Uh, I want to, that, that's it for, oh, that's the last thing I say about Skylark, but I just thought I'd put this one in because Skylark was a great training program for people of my vintage. Now I know the three I mentioned here are not my vintage quite, but I just give three other examples of sort of famous people who learnt the, the ropes, as it were, with Skylark. So there is uh, Andy Fabian, and I won't make a corny question like, you know, where did he get to? Uh, John Zarnecki, who I met just outside, a former president, and, and Jeff Hoffman. Jeff Hoffman was the astronaut who helped to save the Hubble telescope. And he, as you can see, already knew which, which was the business end of a rocket. <laughs> because there's Jeff sitting at the front of this Raven motor before uh, a Lester experiment in, in Spain to look at the Crab Nebula occultation. Anyway, that was it really for Skylight. It wasn't any longer competitive, particularly after Hoover had been launched by the Americans. So it was a question of into orbit, and this was our British opportunity to go into orbit. Um, you'll have all seen pictures of Uhuru before, I, th I suppose. Another in the, in the satellite series, of course, that had been negotiated years before. Instruments, as you'll see, from uh, several university groups and Goddard Space Flight Center as partial return from the fact they were launching it for us. Um, equatorial orbit, just like Uhuru, was really convenient because the low background meant that we could use the same, um, the same satellite data receiving station. Uh, we had two alternatives, Ascension Island and, um, and Quito, which gave us access to the data every 90 minutes. Now, the amount of data was actually quite modest, as you'll see here. The total data for a whole, 90, uh, for a whole orbit from the, one of the instruments, the Sky Survey instrument, which turned out to be the most productive, uh, I am told... Uh, at 30 kilobyte, kilobytes per day amounts about 40 tweets in modern parlance. So we did have to you know, be quite uh, careful with our use of data. Um, but the data from the, the Sky Survey in, in, instrument in particular really was um, a revelation. Um, and we, did, we could do various things by... The, the Sky Survey looked out in the spin pane of the satellite so that we could, as we did several times, point the, um, sp the spin axis at the galactic pole and just sit there for 10 days, 15 days. <coughs> and, and you could then, of course, build up really good statistics. This is a scan of bright sources through the galactic center region. And it was really good, of course, for discovering <coughs> transients. And, one very famous transient, which at the time and quite long after that, we would argue was the best candidate black hole uh, binary source. AO620, which of course became f briefly famous again last, uh, last year when it was highlighted at uh, Stephen Hawking's uh, uh, internment at the uh, Western Sarabi when his daughter, uh, Lucy 
chose it as the black hole to which a message from Stephen would be sent. It's still on its way because it's actually something like 3,000 light years away, but we know that our black hole is actually about to, has been picked out for that. You can, well, you can't see actually from where you're sitting, but the, the light curve of this AO620 was just fantastic. In that you can't, what you can't see probably is the day starting 3rd of August 1975. After a couple of days, as bright as the crab, another day later, as bright as Scorpius X1, and then it carried on getting brighter to become, for a long time, the brightest X-ray source ever seen. What really made this interesting for the, the, the locals was that this coincided with the first ever meeting of the European Astronomical Society at Leicester. And so, you know, we have people from MIT and all over the place, and... We didn't know until, you know, we, we had to be careful of what we said until we were sure of what we said. But we obviously got away with that because it was real. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, some of the, the, most of the other experiments were looking on axis and they got some really good data as well. This is one from the uh, proportional counter from MSSL and... and um, Birmingham that found the first evidence of a thermal ion K line from the Perseus cluster. And that was really important, of course, because <coughs> Uhura had shown that there were quite a lot of these rich clusters that had extended X-ray emission, but the origin was not clear, but this showed actually quite clearly that we were looking at hot gas. The result of the sky survey was about 300 X-ray sources uh, quite a few there are labelled. Um, the most interesting part of the survey to me was that there were a significant number of sources at high latitude that weren't identified. And Uhura had also found quite a, a lot of those. And, uh, and Ricardo Giacconi, for sort of marketing reasons, I suppose, had come up with the, re the name UGLES, which stands for un Unidentified High Galactic Latitude Sources. And he was suggesting, as part of the, you know, the build-up of the case for AXA, which became Chandra, suggesting that this might be something really un unexpected, like a, a pure X-ray galaxy. What we were able to do, and when I say me, it was basically a, a group of younger uh, people with astronomy training who could do these things rather better than, better than me as a physicist, um, and we were able to show that a lot of these, uh, uh, the main fraction of these unidentified high galactic latitude sources were actually safe at galaxies. So what it did then, uh, what we were able to do is establish safe at galaxies as a class of luminous X-ray source. That for me personally was really very timely because uh, that's basically what's kept me out of my wife's hair by going into work every day ever since. Uh, some of the people that were responsible for the actual detective work, Martin Elvis, Andy Lawrence, Martin Ward, Andrew Wilson, I think who is no longer with us as well. And it was all basically done on, in a statistic sense in that the error box on the X-ray source was typically quite big, um, but the bright but we were able to correlate the existence of an X-ray source in one of these big error boxes in a statistically significant correlation with the existence of a bright, safe galaxy. Right, moving on. There was then a really interesting 20-year gap between, <laughs> between in the American program, uh, which meant someone else had to pick up the the, 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 uh, the cudgels, as it were. And so Ezro and then ESA uh, came to our rescue and also collaborations with Germany and ROSA. Well, Exosat, we were talking about that in Madrid, uh, Madrid a couple of days ago. Exosat was a really important mission that really set Europe and the rest of the world in a way in which they, the strong user support would set a new standard and, of course, led directly to, um, well, that was one of the features of Exosat that, that we were very keen on, that uh, towards the end of the mission, when the gas was running out, 
they actually just sat on sources for weeks on end, and that allowed us to get some brilliant uh, time, uh, timing data for several sources, including safer galaxies. And on the basis of that, we were, I think, able to make the case that um, the luminous X-ray emission from safer galaxies is almost certainly analogous to X-ray binary systems, by, in other words, by accretion onto a supermassive black hole. That's a paper led by Andy Lawrence, as you can see. Um, we had a collaboration with Ginga. We were fortunate <coughs> there, and uh, I, I happened to know Minoru Oda quite well. And when the Japanese were looking for a collaboration in science with the Brits, then some of us, I was involved in the SRC at the time, we went over there, and it was going to be either an atmospheric satellite John Horton or an X-ray satellite, it turned out the Japanese sort of typical style had already decided they wanted to collaborate on an X-ray satellite. So that's where Genga came out of that, which was a really interesting mission. And I, I always like to show a picture of Martin Turner, who was a, a real hero uh, of our group in Leicester. He was responsible for the medium energy detector array on Exosat for the large uh, LAC, the large area counter on Ginga, and then as the PI for EPIC on XMM. Sadly, Martin, we lost Martin a few, a few years ago, but there he is, cradling this detector, Ginga detector. One of the, again, the scientific highlights of such are all, as you can see, a bit self-selected, of course, and, and one that uh, we got that's turned out to be quite significant with Ginga because of its large uh, energy bandwidth was from, from a suggestion made by Andy Fabian, namely to look for evidence of reflection, in other words, backscattering from uh, dense material that might be sitting there near the X-ray source. So we did that, and the paper published in Nature in 1990 was the first... The first um, detection of reflection, so-called, from, uh, from AGN. And that, of course, has become a bit of an industry, and I, I think Andrew uh, Fabian was talking this afternoon about reverberation te ne techniques that you can use in order to scale the geometry of a, of the, of a supermassive black hole and its surroundings uh, using, in that case, the, um, the iron fluorescent line. And... A student of mine, again, where, did, where on earth he went to, uh, Paul Nandra, uh, then did a more detailed search of all the data on, on safer galaxies. And uh, in the paper that we had in 94, th there already was a suggestion there that some of the iron lines were actually broad, but we couldn't obviously prove that. We had to leave something for Andy to do. And then quickly on, I've nearly finished, ROSAT. We didn't, well, we were, our involvement in ROSAT just gave us access to data, but the, the British contribution to the hardware was the wide field camera, which produced the first all sky survey in the extreme ultraviolet. And then to finish off, then just mention the two missions that are still operational. Uh, one that's absolutely fantastic in my view, and that's XMM Newton. ESA's direct successor to Exosat, and, and SWIFT. SWIFT, we have a group at Leicester actively involved in SWIFT, and SWIFT, again, you know, with gamma ray bursts and all of that, is a real source of unexpected excitement from time to time, sometimes at awkward times in the week, of course. Um, and so now, where are we now? Well, the UK programme is now very strongly focused on ESA, clearly, um, and... Uh, I, was, I said already, it was with a few others in the audience, we a meeting in Madrid the other day, celebrating what ESA's X-ray astronomy program, where you had Exosat setting new standards, new ways of doing things, on to uh, XMM uh, Newton, with an <coughs> enlarging community, of course, and then from there, from where we are now, I think it places Europe in a really good position technically, scientifically, and politically to deliver the world-class mission that most people are looking forward to, even I'm looking forward to, 
uh, namely Athena, which is due for launch, I believe, in about 19... Uh, not 19, but 2031. <laughs> and so my final message to the younger members of the audience is, enjoy Athena. Okay, I think we have time for one very quick question, if anyone has a quick question for Ken. Yeah, I can only answer questions from people with fairly loud voices. Can you just hang on for the microphone, please? Because <laughs> my wife would tell you that my hearing is a bit crap. <laughs> but I have a... I, I do have a loud voice, but I'll still use the microphone. You're going to tell me. Thank you for a wonderful talk about uh, the history of uh, X-ray astronomy. There's something that's always bugged me about... Uh, the early days of astronomy from space. You mentioned sounding rockets many times. Now, we all know that in space, no one can hear you scream. So where's the sound from a sounding rocket? Where's the sound, where's the sound? Where's the sound from a sounding rocket? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that wasn't because I didn't hear the question. Yeah, I because, it. yeah. I mean, I always say suborbital, actually. Right. Yeah. OK, okay. if you don't know the answer, I'm going to stop asking, because clearly no one does. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, okay. thanks very much, Ken, for a okay. wonderful talk. Thank you. Thank you.